So um, moving on with uh, 2.3, the cardiovascular and the respiratory part of anatomy and physiology, we will do the respiratory system next on the Veterinary Technician Online Review Course. Respiration. What's the point of it? Its primary function is to bring oxygen from the outside air into our body's cells and carry carbon dioxide, which is waste, back out of the body. So the body's cells need oxygen to use nutrients and produce energy. So our cells, that's, that's what they do, is they use nutrients and produce energy. And to do this, they need oxygen. This energy-producing reaction causes a waste product. So in, in, um, all, in a lot of these PowerPoints, we're going to talk about um, cell metabolism and cell waste once it produces energy and uses nutrients, it creates a waste, a cellular waste. And this is carbon dioxide, which needs to be eliminated from the body. And the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system work together to make this all happen. So it's secondary um, function, respiration. It's not just that gas exchange, but also for phonation, which is voice production. So this begins at the larynx. So your vocal cords will vibrate as air passes over them and cause uh, a voice production. Also helps regulate the body temperature. So the nasal passage, which is a part of your respiratory system, your upper respiratory system, helps warm or cool down air before it goes down into the lungs. And um, dogs pant to decrease body temperature. So you know how we often say that cats and dogs don't sweat and they, they actually regulate their temperature by panting and it decreases their body temperatures and that's why dogs pant when they're hot. Um, another function is regulates acid-base balance. So influences the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. So the more carbon dioxide, the lower the blood pH and the more acidic the blood is. So the respiratory system can alter the carbon dioxide blood contact content by just adjusting the respiratory rate. So for example, there's going to be um, a sensor in my body. And if um, there is a buildup of CO2 in my body, because let's say I'm holding my breath and usually I'd be blowing out the CO2, but where I'm not, it's going to build and build and build in my body. And what's going to happen to my blood is that the pH is going to decrease and my body's going to go, oh my God, you need to breathe out the CO2. The pH in our blood is going down. So this respiratory center is going to go breathe, 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 and it will actually increase and force me to breathe to help adjust this pH. So it's an acid-base balance. And then the last, um, one of the other functions of the respiratory system is sense of smell. So there's actually sense receptors found in your nasal passage, which will, which will help you smell. Two steps are needed for respiration to take place. We have external respiration and internal respiration. External respiration occurs in the lungs. So this is the exchange um, of oxygen and CO2 between inhaled air and the blood. So we know, we just talked about the cardiovascular system and we said that when the blood leaves the pulmonary artery and goes to the lungs, what it does is it gets rid of the CO2 in the blood from the deoxygenated blood and picks up oxygen. And this all happens um, from the capillaries that are hugging the alveoli in the lungs. And that's where the gas exchange happens. So that's external respiration. Okay, so then I externally breathe that CO2 that I just picked up from my blood. Um, and then there's internal respiration. This occurs all over your body, and it's actually the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the blood and the cells. So my heart is going to pump all this yummy oxygenated blood through my whole body. The arteries are going to turn into arterioles, which are then going to go into little capillaries that are going to be all around the tissues in my body. And that's where they're going to give nutrients and oxygen, and that's where that exchange happens. And then the tissue, the cellular metabolism will cause, cause a waste, which is CO2, and that's where the blood's going to pick up that CO2 and bring it back to the heart, okay? And that exchange between cells and tissue is internal respiration. So structures of the respiratory tract, we have an upper respiratory tract, so it's a distal cranial, so the lungs, so anything above the lungs, okay? Uh, we have our nostrils, our nasal passage, our pharynx, our larynx, and our trachea. 
So this picture right here is showing you exactly that. You um, can see our upper respiratory tract. This is the nostrils or the nares. It'll lead into our nasal passage, leading down into our pharynx and our larynx, um, and the trachea leading down here, going into the lungs. So the nares, which are nostrils, are the external opening of the respiratory tract. They lead into the nasal passage. And the nasal passage is between the nostrils and the pharynx. And remember, your pharynx is just your throat. The functions of the nasal passage is they have scent receptors, so they can smell things. Um, the nasal passage also warms, humidifies, and filters inhaled air before it goes down into the lungs. The midline of our nasal passage is actually divided by a nasal septum. Now remember, a septum is just a separation. We just did the cardiovascular system and we talked about that um, what separates the right atria, atrium from the left atrium, and it was an interatrial septum, okay? Inter meaning between, atria meaning the atria, and the septum is the division, the separation. So it should come to no surprise that the nasal passage is div divided from right and left side of, your, of the face by a nasal septum. Dorsal and ventral aspect are separated by a hard and a soft palate. Okay, so the front of your nasal passage, so the the more um, the closer to your nares, we have a hard palate. If you push your tongue up to the top of your mouth, you can feel the hard palate. And then the ventral aspect, or the back part, or, or sorry, that would be the dorsal in a quadruped, but in us it would more so be um, the posterior part of our mouth because we're bipeds. But the back part, and you can feel it with your tongue, is the soft palate. So it's not one straight tube that leaves that goes from your nares back to your pharynx. It's actually it's convoluted, which means that there's folds and twists and it's coiled. And all of this is because of the turbinates. So that's what you're going to find in your nasal passage. And um, and it's all kind of intertwined into this weird folded, twisted mess. And those are the turbinates. And that's what your nasal passage actually looks like. It's not just one straight tube. And uh, interesting fact, the ingestion, like when you, when you get like a slushy and you drink it really fast, it actually leads to increased pressure within your turbinates. And that's what a brain freeze is. You know, when you drink that slurpee, and you go, oh my God, brain freeze, and you feel like your head's going to explode. That's actually because an increase in pressure in your turbinates because of the coldness that you just drink. This right here is depicting your nasal septum. So this is, um, this right here is separating right from left side of your nasal passage. Pretty disgusting picture because it's, um, it's a real dissection, but you can see the separation between the right and the left um, nasal passage. This right here is a very cool picture of your turbinates. So we're looking into the nose of this patient and, and you can kind of see all the twists and turns um, and the convolutedness of the nasal passage in here. This is such a cool picture. So it's not just one straight tube leading down into your pharynx, it's actually convoluted in there. So there's something, uh, there's, you also have to keep in mind of the sinuses that you have within your nasal passage. You have a para, the, our patients will have paranasal sinuses. Uh, they're ciliated out pouchings of the nasal passage contained within spaces in certain skull bones. And then most animals have two frontal sinuses and two maxillary sinuses within the frontal and maxillary bone. And this picture will show you those sinuses there. So when you get a sinus cold and it gets all plugged up with mucus, that's what's actually getting filled with mucus are these, these hollow areas, these sinuses. Um, continuing on from the nasal passage, we move down into the pharynx, which is your throat area. It's a common passageway for respiratory and digestive system. Don't forget in your throat, there's two passageways. It can go down your esophagus to your alimentary system, or it can go down your trachea to your respiratory system. The caudal end of the pharynx opens dorsally into the esophagus and ventrally into the larynx. So this is very important to remember during intubation that ventrally you will go into the trachea, dorsally you will go into the esophagus. So very important to remember. Reflexes control actions of the muscles around the pharynx. 
So larynx and pharynx work together to prevent swallowing from interfering with breathing and vice versa. So when you're swallowing, breathing actually stops. The laryngeal opening is covered and the material that you're eating is swallowed and moves down to the rear of your pharynx and goes to the esophagus opening because the larynx, the opening to your trachea, the larynx area is shut. So it'll automatically go down your esophagus. After swallowing, the larynx is reopened and breathing resumes all over again. And that's how your body um, controls or helps prevent aspiration when you're eating. The larynx, which is the beginning of the trachea, is also known as the voice box. Voc vocal cords will vibrate as, pass as air passes over them, making a sound. That's why it's called a voice box. Um, it's, short, irregular, it's a short irregular tube connecting the pharynx to the trachea. It's composed of cartilaginous structures that are connected to each other and the surrounding tissues by muscle. And you'll see this in the next slide. It's supported in place by the hyoid bone. We talked about the hyoid bone being a part of our axial skeleton and it's uh, the, it helps support the larynx. The epiglottis is part of the larynx as well. So this, this is that flap that covers the larynx when we're swallowing our piece of pizza, okay? So it prevents foreign materials from being inhaled by folding back over the glottis or the tracheal opening. This picture here shows you our larynx. So it, this is our trachea here, and this is the larynx. So this is the epiglottis that's gonna shut over it when we're swallowing so that food doesn't go our, down our trachea. And you can see the different types of cartilages that make up the larynx. And then uh, the last structure of our upper respiratory tract is our trachea. It's a short, wide tube. It extends from the larynx down into the thorax. And then as it goes down into the thorax, it actually bifurcates. So it divides into two main bronchi that enter the right lung and the left lung. The trachea is composed of fibrous tissue and smooth muscle, and it's all held open by a hyaline cartilage rings. We talked about different types of cartilage during our tissue lectures, and hyaline cartilage is one of them. And our, our C-shaped rings on our trachea is actually made up of this hyaline cartilage. And thanks to these rings in our trachea, it keeps this tube open at all times. Unlike our esophagus, which is a collapsed tube, it doesn't have these cartilage rings holding it open. And our trachea is lined with ciliated epithelium. So epithelium, the epithelium has cilia on it, which are like these little finger-like protrusions, and those will actually help catch foreign materials and bring them out. So when you cough and you feel mucus come up, that's thanks to your cilia in your trachea that's actually taking all that debris and foreign material and pushing it up out of your trachea because that's your body's way of stopping it from going down into the lungs. So this picture right here is showing you those C-shaped rings of the hyaline cartilage, um, which is right here. And then this is the smooth muscle open part of the trachea and it's dorsally, and that's where the smooth muscle is gonna be. The, the gap between the ends of each ring bridges by smooth muscle, which is what you see here. And this is the inside of the trachea. So, let's move down into our lower respiratory tract. And the lower respiratory tract is made up of our bronchi, bronchioles, alveolar ducts, which lead to the alveoli. So let's start with the bronchi. Remember we talked about the trachea and how it leads down towards the, uh, the thoracic, it leads down into the thoracic cavity and bifurcates. So um, it splits into two right and left branches and those are the bronchi. So one bronchi is, well it's a bronchus and then two of them together plural is a bronchi. So you can see here um, the trachea is coming down and then it goes into right and left bronchi and it leads into the lungs. Each bronchus divides into smaller branches called bronchioles. And bronchioles um, uh, basically are the subdivisions of our bronchi and can continue to divide into smaller air passageways. So the bronchi, it kind of splits, it, think of it as like the root of a tree, right? So the, it, the roots kind of branch off of each other and then the bronchioles, which branched off of the bronchus, will branch down into even smaller air passageways um, into an alveolar duct, which will then at the very tip, tip, tip of this alveolar duct, you will find an alveolar sac and that's where gas exchange happens. 
and this is the alveoli here where external respiration takes place. Remember, we have external respiration and internal respiration. External respiration being the exchange of gas at the alveoli level, and then internal respiration is the gas exchange that happens between blood and tissue inside your body. So each alveoli is surrounded and hugged by capillaries. So and this is where the cardiovascular system comes into play with the respiratory system. This is deoxygenated blood that came in from our pulmonary artery that got shot out from the right ventricle of our heart. It comes in here and it hugs these alveolar sacs. It will spit out CO2 into the sac and steal oxygen that was breathed in. And then it will um, go into these uh, right here, depicted in red because it's oxygenated, and make its way back into the pulmonary veins because it's it'll go back into the left side of the heart. And that's how um, gas exchange happens. So uh, continuing on with gas exchange, simple diffusion of gas molecules according to the concentration gradient. That is how oxygen moves out or how oxygen moves into the blood and how CO2 moves out. It's just simple diffusion. So basically molecule, molecules will move from one area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So the alveolar capillary blood contains very little oxygen, right? It's the deoxygenated blood that's coming from the heart, and it, but it's going to have a lot of CO2 because it's deoxygenated and it's carrying all the waste that it picked up from our whole body. Okay, so um, because it is the deoxygenated blood from the heart, but these capillaries are circulating right next to the alveolar sac, right? And that alveolar sac has high O2 and low CO2 because it's the air that we just breathed in from, from the outside, right? From our inspired air. So automatically, because of simple diffusion, these molecules are gonna move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So if we have low O2 in the blood in the capillaries coming from the heart, but high O2 in the alveolar sac, they're automatically gonna swap. So that oxygen is gonna move into the blood towards the area of lower concentration. But if we have, but in that same blood, we have high amount of CO2, but there's a low amount of CO2 in the alveolar sac from the inspired air, that CO2 is gonna diffuse towards the alveolar sac because it's gonna to move towards the area of lower concentration. And there, because of that simple diffusion, now we have oxygenated blood and the CO2 can now be discarded through respiration. And um, just kind of when I keep saying that when you inspire air, you have high oxygen and low CO2. The atmospheric air that we're breathing in has roughly 21% oxygen and 0.03% carbon dioxide. So that's what I mean by low CO2 and high oxygen. This right here is showing you that simple diffusion. So we have our air sac here with our deoxygenated blood, red blood cells coming in here. So we're gonna spit out carbon dioxide because there's low carbon dioxide here in our inspired air and there's high CO2 here from all the waste brought in from our body. And we're low oxygen here because we need to pick that up because we used it throughout our body through internal respiration. Um, the oxygen is then going to flow this way because it's low oxygen here. And then CO2 is going to go that way. And now we have yummy oxygenated blood that goes back to our heart into the left side of the heart so it can be pumped out into our aorta to feed our entire body and help with internal respiration. So the lungs themselves, the lower respiratory tract is located in the lungs, okay? So when we're talking about the, the respiratory tract, it's just the upper respiratory, which is the nares, nasal passage, pharynx, larynx, trachea, which lead down into the lower respiratory tract, which is your bronchi, bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli. All of this, or at least the lower respiratory tract, and um, is located within the lungs. Now, the mediastinum, remember we talked about that in the cardiovascular system, that's where the heart lies. The mediastinum is the area between these two lungs. So that's where the mediastinum lies. The lungs are divided in two lobes in most species. There's going to be variability within species. Um, there is something called a hilus, which is a small area on the medial side of the lung. And what happens here is th this is a site where air, blood, lymph, and nerve um, nerves enter and leave the lungs. So the only part of the lung 
that is um, fastened in place is at the hilus. The rest of the lung is completely free floating within the thoracic cavity. Okay, so the medial side of the lung is the hilus, and that's where it's attached, and that's where all the blood vessels and nerve endings and stuff go, or nerves go into the lungs itself. The lung tissue is light and spongy. I don't know if you guys remember feeling the lungs during dissection, but it has a spongy feel to it. And the lungs, keep in mind, in the fetus are completely non-functional. The lungs only start playing a role the second they're born and take their first breath. This here is a picture of the lung. They have a convex lateral surface, which lies um, against the inner surface of the thoracic wall. And then the mediastinum is right there in the, lies right there in the middle of those lungs. Lungs are divided into lobes, like I said, in most species, but it will vary. The lobes are distinguished by major branches of the bronchi. Um, uh, you you can watch this um, this video link that I have here, which will help you understand all this. And the hilus is a site where the air, blood, and lymph and nerves enter into the lungs. Um, and the hilus can also sometimes be called the root of the lungs. The thoracic cavity itself, so the lungs and most of the respiratory tract lies within the thoracic cavity, because keep in mind the thoracic, the thorax, or sorry, the trachea leads up into your throat as well, right? So um, the part, part of your um, trachea goes down into your thoracic cavity. The dorsal part of your thoracic cavity is bound by the thoracic vertebrae. The lateral part of your thoracic cavity, so the sides of your chest, are bound by ribs and intercostal muscles. So in between these ribs, there's musculature, and those are called intercostal muscles. And then the ventral aspect of your thoracic cavity is bound by the sternum. And the contents within this thoracic cavity, we've talked about all these, uh, contain the lungs, the heart, blood vessels, nerves, trachea, esophagus, goes through the thoracic cavity to get down into the abdominal cavity, uh, lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes as well, all found in the thoracic cavity. Now, Let's talk about the membranes in the thoracic cavity. There's something called a pleura. This is a thin membrane that lines the thoracic cavity and covers the organs and structures inside the thorax. So we have our visceral layers. And remember, that shouldn't be too hard. We now know that viscera means organs. So the visceral layer, obviously, is the layer of membrane that covers the organs in the thoracic cavity. And then we have our parietal layer, which lines the cavity itself. Now, there is this tiny, tiny little um, non-visible space in between these two layers, and it's filled with pleural fluid. And this helps with lubrication, okay? So it ensures that the surfaces of the organs slide smoothly along the lining of the thoracic during breathing because we don't want it dry and it create friction, okay? So it has to be lubricated with some kind of fluid and that's called pleural fluid. So the pleura is the membrane in the thoracic cavity. It's divided into the visceral layer, which hugs the organs, and the parietal layer, which lines the cavity itself. This picture here is showing you um, the layers. So this is our thoracic cavity. It's all lined by a membrane. Remember the heart that was covered by a pericardial sac and the heart uh, and the, the lungs are no different. They're covered by a sac. We have our parietal or parietal pleura, which lines the outside. So it touches the outside of the thorax. And then our visceral pleura, which is the inside layer that hugs the actual organ. And between these two, there is a pleural fluid that helps with lubrication as the lungs are moving. The diaphragm. The diaphragm is a large muscle. It's located at the most uh, caudal aspect of the thorax. It's a thin, thin dome-shaped skeletal muscle sheet. It forms the caudal boundary of the thorax. It's an important respiratory muscle, so it flattens when it contracts and enlarges the volume of the thorax and aids in inspiration. And we're going to talk more about how the diaphragm helps with this respiration process. So this here is a picture 
of uh, the diaphragm. We're kind of looking down onto it. So um, you can see the vena cava will go through it. The esophagus passes through the diaphragm as well to get down into the abdominal cavity. The aorta passes through that because remember the heart's up in the thoracic cavity. It has to get down into the lower part of our body somehow. And it does this by going through this opening here. So there's three different openings in the diaphragm there to help with um, vessels and other um, organs to pass through like the esophagus. So the process of respiration. So it can happen um, in different ways, but the pressure within the thorax is negative with respect to the atmospheric pressure. So um, it pulls the lungs tight out against the thoracic wall that negative pressure does. Lungs follow passively as movement of the thoracic wall and diaphragm alternately enlarge and reduce the volume of the thorax. So, so really the reason why our lungs are following this movement is just because the thoracic wall and the diaphragm are enlarging and reducing, allowing air in and out of the thoracic cavity. Um, negative intrathoracic pressure helps draw blood through the veins and into the atria. So thanks to that negative pressure, it helps with that as well. During inspiration, this is the process of drawing air into the lungs, so inhalation. It results from the enlargement of the thoracic cavity by inspiratory muscles. So the lungs enlarge passively. Remember, because of the negative pressure within our thoracic cavity, our inspiratory muscles in our thoracic cavity are going to enlarge and our lungs just follow. And what happens is it draws in air. So you always think that you're making your lungs inhale, but it's not. It's your inspiratory muscles in your thoracic cavity that are enlarging. Therefore, your lungs just follow the leader because of the negative pressure, and that will suck in the air into the, your lungs. The main inspiratory muscles that we're talking about in the thoracic cavity is the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. Intercostal meaning in between the ribs. And I'm going to show you guys a picture because there's external intercostal muscles and internal intercostal muscles. Um, and I'll show you a picture showing you that. But um, nonetheless, the main inspiratory muscles is the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. So when the diaphragm and the external internal cost, intercostal muscles um, enlarge, thanks to the negative pressure, our lungs will follow, sucking in the air into our lungs. This is a diagram here showing you the difference between the internal intercostal muscles and the external intercostal muscles. Nonetheless, both of them are located um, between the intercostal space and aid in respiration in some way. Expiration. So now that we've talked about inhalation and how that happens, let's talk about exhalation. So expiration, it's, it's pushing out of air. So this results from a decreased volume of the thoracic cavity. So the main expiratory muscle is the internal intercostal muscles and the abdominal muscles. Whereas remember the inspiratory muscles were the external intercostal muscles and the diaphragm, our expiratory muscles is the internal internal intercostal muscles as well as our abdominal muscles. Contraction of the abdominal muscles pushes the abdominal organs up against the diaphragm and pushes the diaphragm back into its dome shape, which will then decrease the space in the thorax, making the air push out. And that's how we exhale. It's really amazing when you think about how this happens, because when you inhale, you think, oh, I'm just inflating my lungs and deflating my lungs, when really you have no control over that. The lungs are just following the leader. They're just passively moving because of the negative pressure in my lungs. What I'm actually doing when I'm breathing in is altering my diaphragm and the muscles that are in between my ribs. And then when I expire, it's just your abdominal muscles and as well as the muscles in between your ribs causing a decreased space in your in your thorax causing the air to get pushed out it's really amazing so respiratory volumes so this is the quantity of air involved in respiration very important to know um, there's the tidal volume which is the volume of ins of air inspired and expired during one breath so 
That's my tidal volume. It varies according to the body's need. Again, if I'm going for a jog, my tidal volume is going to be completely different. Um, there's a minute volume. So this is the volume of air inspired and expired during a one minute time span. Obviously, this, is gonna, this can alter um, as well uh, according to the body's needs. And then residual volume is the volume of air remaining in the lungs after maximum expiration. You can push out all the air that you want out of your lungs. There's always going to be a residual volume left within your lungs. So the respiratory center, we've already kind of talked about this when we talked about how the body recognizes CO2 and, and the pH in our blood. So the respiratory center, uh, respiration itself is controlled by an area in the medulla oblongata of the brain stem, and it's called the respiratory center. So there's a certain area in the brain, in the medulla oblongata specifically, and that's the respiratory center. This controls respiration, uh, resp respiratory muscle contractions. So it directs timing and strength of contraction. So this can be consciously controlled. I can make myself breathe, but I can only control it for a brief period. Um, but then involuntary or automatic respiration will kick in. And that's thanks to this respiratory center. So the next time your child threatens you and says, I'm going to hold my breath and he's going to hold his, and he sits there and holds his breath, just go ahead and let him because eventually he's not going to suffocate and die because thanks to this respiratory center and his medulla oblongata, it'll automatically um, involuntarily start working on its own and make him breathe. Okay. So that's thanks to our respiratory center. So I can control it. I can hold my breath for so long until eventually my respiratory center is going to kick in and make that breath happen. And this picture here is just showing you um, the, this is actually a picture of the medulla oblongata and showing you different respiratory centers there um, and how that affects your breathing. So systems that control uh, breathing, there's two main systems. There's the mechanical system, so sets routine inspiration and expiration limits. And then there's a chemical system, which monitors levels of substances in the blood. And we talked a little bit about that, about the blood pH and CO2. So um, it directs the adjustment of breathing It does um, if dissolved substances are out of balance. Okay, and let's talk about that. So the mechanical control. There are stretch receptors in the lungs that set limits on routine resting and inspiration or resting inspiration and expiration. So the respiratory sends out nerve impulses when the lungs inflate to a certain point. And then it stops the muscle from contract from contraction that produces inspiration and starts contractions to produce expiration. And that's thanks to um, the respiratory center that's, that senses these re stretch receptors on the lungs. They'll say, whoa, 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 we stretch right to the max. Let's deflate here. Let's go back down. Let's start contracting and produce expiration. Another set of nerve impulses sent when lungs deflate sufficiently and so then those stretch receptors are going to send a message up to your brain going okay we've deflated enough these stretch receptors are down to normal um, let's inspire again so it'll stop expiration and start the process of inspiration all over again so this mechanical control happens by the stretch receptors that are actually located within the lungs again um, controlled by the brain um, the respiratory center, but by nerves. Now the chemical control system, this has nothing to do with the stretch receptors in the lungs. It's chemical receptors are in the blood vessels. They're actually located in the carotid artery and the aorta. And these chemical receptors monitor the CO2, the pH, and the O2 that's going through the arterial blood supply. So the arterial blood supply, so it's, that's the blood, the oxygenated blood getting pumped out of the left side of the heart. There's these little tiny receptors these, and they monitor that. So if any of these get out of balance, the chemical control system will adjust respiration to fix it. So our CO2 and our pH are usually linked. We've talked about this a few slides back. So if we increase CO2, so I hold my breath, Typically, my body would be um, releasing the CO2 when I breathe out. 
But if I hold my breath and I don't breathe out, that CO2 is going to build and build and build and build and build in my blood. What's going to happen is my blood pH is going to go down. And this is going to trigger, remember those little tiny chemical receptors in our, in our arteries that are constantly monitoring? They're going to go, wait a minute, our CO2 is going way up, the blood pH is going way down, and it's going to trigger the respiratory center to increase the rate and depth of respiration to get rid. They're going to say, "Let we got to get rid of the CO2. We got to get our blood pH back to normal. So they're going to start increasing the rate and depth of our respiration to fix that. Low oxygen, so hypoxia, causes respiratory center to increase respiration rate as well. So... Um, if I'm holding my breath, my CO2 is going to build up and my O2 is going to go down, causing hypoxia. And um, my respiratory center is automatically just going to cause me to start uh, increased respiration rate to help fix that problem.